Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu askuru allaha zikran kaseeran wa sabbihu bukratan wa asilan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who have believed, remember Allah with much remembrance and exalt him morning and afternoon. We talk a lot about zikr. Uh, people sometimes think of zikr in a very narrow sense. It's like taking the tasbih out and sitting and uh, doing tasbih after salah. The word zikr is actually much more complicated than that. It's bigger and wider. For example, the Quran is also zikr. So anything that you do with regards to the Quran is zikr. So if you read the Quran, it is zikr. If you are struggling like me to memorize the Quran, parts of it, it is zikr. If you are reading the translation of the Quran, it is zikr. If you are telling people about the Quran, it is zikr. Even if you are telling your children, go read the Quran and learn the Quran, it is zikr. So anything that is to do with zikr, with Quran, is zikr. Salah is also zikr. So when we pray Salah, that is Zikr. So maybe sometimes when you're doing Niya for Salah, you can also say, I'm going to do, I'm going to offer two rakat Zikr and Fajr. It is fine. It is synonymous. It's a bigger concept than Salah. Salah is a smaller concept than Zikr. And the third, which is the often commonly used conception of Zikr, which is the invocation of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a recitation of La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and so on and so forth. So one thing that I would like people to do is to think of zikr in a broader sense. The zikr means many things. Because some of, you need to understand this because of what I'm going to say subsequently today, inshallah. One man once came to the Prophet sallallahu his name was very unusual. I have never encountered him before in the Hadith literature. His name is Abdullah ibn Bush, 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 Bushra. He came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Islam has too many commands for me to remember. There are only four commands, one state of the heart. But anyway, for him, there were too many things to do. He says, can, can you reduce all of this to one thing that I can hold on to? Just one thing that I will never forget and I will never give up. Ya Rasulullah, can you reduce the whole of the deen to one thing? He said, oh Messenger of Allah, I'm overwhelmed by the so many injunctions of Islam. Uh, and this is in uh, the Hadith collection of At-Tirmidhi. Prophet said very simply, keep your tongue wet with the remembrance of Allah. Keep your tongue wet with the remembrance of Allah. For those of us who are fasting and our mouth dries, that's one more interesting thing to do while fasting is to do zikr and remember the name of Allah, it will keep your tongue wet. But it's a beautiful thing. And remembrance of Allah, the Prophet didn't even prescribe to him what he should recite in his remembrance. He didn't say remember Allah by doing this. So even if he just says Allah, 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 that's enough, it is remembrance of Allah. Lots of people, when someone asks you what is Allah, often translate that as that is a generic Arabic term for the word God. Don't ever do that because that is not what it is. Allah is the sum total of all the other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Hafiz. He's Majid. Lots of other, you know the 99 names. Each of them is an essence and an attribute. When you take all of them and put them all together, then it becomes Allah. That's why just remembering Allah as Allah is, is like remembering Him in all His glory, in all His effect. So Prophet ﷺ told him, remember Allah and keep your tongue wet. That is an important part for us to remember. Anas ibn Malik says something very beautiful about the remembrance of Allah. He says that he who comes and prays the Salah to Fajr in Jannah, and I notice that a lot of you are blessed to do that, who live very close by, who come and pray the Salat al-Fajr in Jummah, and then, after they have prayed the Salat al-Fajr, they stay here and invoke the name of Allah. They sit here and do zikr in the masjid. 
And you can do, like I said, zikr, anything. Read the Quran, try to memorize a new surah, or just sit there and invoke the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then prays two rakats and goes home. It is as if, the Prophet said, it is like performing a perfect hajj and umrah, subhan. So just coming and praying two rakats in congregation, fajr, staying till it's dawn. And in between that, you do zikr. In between that, when you do zikr, it is like performing a perfect hajj and perfect zikr. This is important. Do not underestimate the power of the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu wa The whole life is about remembrance of Allah Subhanahu wa And the word remembrance is not a good translation of the word zikr. Zikr is to mention, zikr is to remember, zikr is to know, to do ta'aruf, to learn about Allah Subhanahu wa to understand Him, to comprehend Him. There was this Sufi master who used to go around telling everybody and his disciples that I know exactly when Allah Ta'ala is remembering me. And all his poor disciples were very impressed with him and said, wow, not only does Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala remember this man, our great master, but this master knows that Allah Ta'ala is remembering him. It's like when someone tweets you or sends a message, your cell phone beeps. But one day, he got a student like me and says, come on, Sheikh, how do you know this? How do you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is thinking about you and how do you know that? Please let me know. So he replied very simply, the Sheikh said very simply, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim he cited from Surah Al-Baqarah, فَأَسْكُرُونِي أَسْكُرُكُمْ فَأَشْكُرُولِي لَا تَكْفُرُمْ So remember me, I will remember you. So remember me, I will remember you and be grateful to me and do not deny me. So I'm remembering Allah and I know when I'm remembering Allah. Like I'm, like now, you and I are remembering Allah and I know that now, because we are remembering Allah, Allah is remembering us. So it's not a big surprise. In fact, there's another beautiful hadith. This is hadith of Qudsi. I, I quote a lot of hadith of Qudsi. If you really want to know why, you have to come uh, on the 10th of July and I will talk about various specialized collections of ahadith here in the Halakha. You know, the 42 collections of Imam Nabawi, but there are also Hadith Husi collections. In this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when my servant thinks of me, I think of my servant. So you have a tremendous connection and power. If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to think about you, all you have to do is to think about him. This is important. So the second thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when my servant mentions my name in his heart, I mention his name in my heart. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when my servant remembers me, I remember him. When he mentions my name in his heart, I mention his name in myself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when my servant mentions my name in public, I mention his name in a more august assembly, in a better congregation. Which means that when we get together as believers, as friends in the masjid, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers us in the assembly of angels, which is a much better assembly than ours. So in that sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember me and I will remember you. This is an important part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and I want you to I'm going to start this part of my discussion with a caveat. This is a bit of my own personal understanding of these ayats. This is kind of an ishtihar. So, take it with caution or reject it. That is fine. Okay. The mainstream tafasids do not uh, interpret this ayah the way I'm doing it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. تُطْلُ مَا أُوْهِيَ إِلَيْكَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَشْرَى وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَلِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مَا تَسْنَعُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kabut, recite, it is addressed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, recite, O Muhammad, what has been revealed to you of the book? 
Recite what is revealed to you of a book and establish prayer. Establish prayer. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing. That is, as-salata tanha anil fahsha wal munkar. So when you pray salah regularly, you people will automatically shed their bad habits, like bad clothes. The Prophet sallallahu once pointed a tree to a companion and the tree's leaves had fallen off. He said, did you see this tree? Look at the, the leaves of this tree fall off. For a believer who performs his salah regularly, bad habits and sins fall off like this. So it is, you will shed your bad habits. Sometimes we, uh, I even hear sermons where people are talking and berating others to give up small bad habits. It is better that we encourage people to maintain salah. Even if you want people to give up tiny bad habits, those small bad habits will automatically disappear if people are particular about establishing their salah. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهَ أَكْبَرُ But the zikr of Allah is greater than salah. So it's a very interesting point you saying, and Allah knows what you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that prayer is good for you. When you establish prayer, you give up bad habits, especially fahsha, lewd things, awful language, bad way of speaking, looking at bad things. We live in an age where a large part of our population is addicted to pornography, etc. If you're praying regularly, those things will go away, inshallah, automatically. So if you establish salah, it has these byproducts. Purpose of salah is something else, but the byproduct of salah is that you will lose bad habits. But zikr of Allah is better than it. Now you would ask why? Why is zikr of Allah better? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says elsewhere in the Quran, Bismillah Rahmani Rahim, Inna ni ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana. Indeed I am Allah and there is no God but me. Indeed, I am Allah and there is no God but me. So serve me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am Allah. There is no God but me. So serve me and establish salah for remembrance of me. This is very clear in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I am God. And I'm testifying that there is no God but me. So service me, be my servant, obey me, me, worship me, and establish salah in order to remember me. So the purpose of salah is the, the purpose of salah is to remember. It is one structure of zikr, one way of remembering Allah is to, yes, it's an obligation, you have to do it five times, it's not a substitute. You can't say that, okay, I'm not going to pray Zohar now, I'll just sit here and do some tasbih. No, that's not how it works. <coughs> it's an obligation that is required to do. It's a requirement, it's a fad. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. But the purpose of it, according to this, I and the Quran, is to remember Allah. It is to do zikr for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So zikr is important. You cannot in any way undermine the importance of zikr. Uh, I have a couple of health issues. Uh, I have sleep apnea, which means that I barely sleep for 30, 40 seconds and then I get up because I stop breathing. And uh, one of the problems with sleep apnea is that every time you stop breathing, your brain kicks you up and wakes you up and you get up and then you start breathing and you fall asleep. People who have very severe apnea are basically getting up every 10 seconds. So they never sleep all night. So you have to sleep with a machine attached to you so that if one time your brain forgets to wake you up, you're gone. So every time you go to sleep, there's no guarantee. In any way, there is no guarantee that you'll wake up, but for sleep apnea patients, that is. I also have fear of heights, and I also have fear of closed places. So when I fly, especially international, it's an agony. Especially if I get a corner seat in the last row, I'm dead. So I'm claustrophobic, sitting in this corner seat, especially it's not even moving back. And I can't sleep because I know it's dangerous for me to sleep. So no matter how long the flights are, flew to Malaysia 16 hours from New York, stayed up all night, <laughs> all 16 hours, refusing to sleep. And 
So one day, this was several years ago, uh, I went to Berlin and it was in the middle of a conference. And there was no halal food, so I went out looking for Turkish places to eat. I saw a park, I bought some food. I was sitting there and on my phone, I was reading the Quran and I read this ayah of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Ladina amanu wa tatmainu al-Qulubuhum bi zikrillah. Allah bi zikrillahi tatmainu al-Qulub. This ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those who believe and whose hearts are assured by the remembrance of Allah unquestionably by the remembrance of Allah our hearts are content. So I kept thinking about this that whole day that bi zikrullah tatmainu al-Qulub. And now every time I'm fly, every time I'm in the situation of either I'm feeling claustrophobic, feeling anxiety or pain, I just start doing zikr with kasir. And what it does, it, believe it or not, I can, I'm a witness to that, it just calms me down. I'm not claustrophobic, there is no fear of sleeping. I can even actually sit down and while I'm reciting and remembering Allah and invoking His name, we can rest. This is my personal experience and it is an important thing for us to understand that it is through zikr of Allah that we find contentment of heart. This is something really very powerful that our hearts find contentment only through remembrance of Allah. It is like take a fish out of water and throw it on land and see what happens to the fish. You can see it struggling. So a heart that does not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that fish that's taken out of the water and tossed, desperate to get back to the ocean. So it is, it is but natural that we need to go back and remember our hearts need contentment, satisfaction. In the absence of contentment, our hearts are suffering from many diseases. Uh, the ulama and scholars have listed more than 77 diseases of the heart. Anxiety, jealousy, anger, envy, dissatisfaction. People are rich. I know people who make 20, 30, 40 times more money than I can even think of making and they are less happy, they are less content, less secure in what they are. So this security, this salam and aman comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a salam and He will give you salam. And he will give you salam only when you remember him. It is through his remembrance that you bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. If you do not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will not remember you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulih. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, Inna fi khalaqa samawati wal ard wa akhtilafi ilay laylan wa nahar lay ayati li ulul al-ba'ad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of the night and the day are signs for those who understand. Uh, remember this word, ulul al-ba'ad people who understand. And if you want to know who these people are, who are these people who understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the next ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-Ladheena yaskurun allaha qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaroon fi khalaqa samawati walad rabbana ma khalaqta hadha ya atilam subhanaka faqina azab anna. This is one of the my most favorite ayahs in the Quran, and I'll tell you why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the heavens and the earth there are signs for those who understand, ulul al ba and these people who understand are those people, people who understand are those people who remember Allah while they are standing, who do zikr of Allah while they are sitting, who do zikr of Allah while they are lying on their sides. The Prophet ﷺ is to sleep on his right side with his right hand under his head. That is, was his way of falling asleep. That was his posture so on his right side. And it is quite possible that he also would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. So when you are in that posture, also remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And then they were at the Fakka room and they reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. And what I like most about this ayah is it integrates both zikr and fikr in the same sentence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the people of understanding are those who do zikr while standing, while sitting, while lying down. All the time they are remembering Allah. But it is not a mindless zikr. It is a zikr with fikr in it. Who, who reflect on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they reflect on it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He has shown us His signs on the horizon and inside ourselves. So you reflect on the signs which are on the horizon and reflect on the signs which are inside you. And while you reflect upon the signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord did not create all these universe aimlessly. There is a purpose to this. And then of course, the ayah ends with the dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save us from hellfire. Now this is an important verse for us. It to me encapsulates the importance of zikr in our life. The purpose of our creation is to remember Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that at one point he brought the entire progeny of Adam and asked them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, am I not your Lord? We all witnessed that he is. So one, one of the things that we do when we remember Allah ta'ala is also remember our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we have already witnessed that he is one God. And so when we remember Allah, we remember our commitment to Him. We remember that He is our Lord and we are here to witness Him in this world. So this constant remembering of Allah, this constant witnessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the purpose of life. But this purpose of life is not mindless. We are like twin engine jets. We are flying on two engines. One is our mind and the other is our heart. The zikr is in the heart and the fikr is in the mind. We can't separate, we can't turn one thing off and fly on one. Go in their different directions. So if you want to fly straight, you turn both engines off. And this eye captures both. It's not saying become an ascetic, it's not saying leave this world and go away and hide in the mountains and just sit there and do zikr forever. No, it's saying do that but also think and reflect on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayatina, our signs, it means that it's a much more complicated term than just sign. It's like saying, oh my God, today I saw the blue moon. There was all this nonsense being sent on the internet. We said that the moon was going to do tawaf of the Kaaba once in 100 million years or something last week. And that is what people were saying is one of the signs of Allah. No, the fact that the moon does tawaf of the sun every month is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's confirmed and we witness it all the time. This entire universe is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight in the evening, uh, we have a halakha here from 7 o'clock till 8, 8.15, inshallah. It's about the story of the Sahaba. Uh, we will talk about the importance of the Sahaba how without them we would not have many elements of a deen, how they preserve the deen, how they transfer the Quran to us and others, the importance of the hadith, literature, etc. And I will also talk about individual uh, Sahaba, especially uh, the Sahaba about whom we have only heard their names but not much. We talk about lots of others. Uh, and those of you who are who have access to the internet. If you Google my name today, I have reflections on Bilal radiallahu anhu, uh, the African uh, companion of the Prophet uh, Especially in this age where racism is becoming so brutal in this country at least, the manifestations of racism and racial intolerance is so awful. Ferguson, Baltimore, South Carolina. It is important to go back and reflect on the life of Bilal. Uh, Hazrat Umar used to say, that uh, Abu Bakr is our master, Sayyidna. Abu Bakr is our master. And he freed our master, Bilal, Sayyidna. So he would refer to both Abu Bakr Siddiq, and to Bilal as, uh, as our masters. And we can never forget the gift that Bilal has given to us. We already heard it twice today, it's the Azan. The Azan. It's one, uh, one day the Prophet Sallallahu after Salat al-Fajr, was performing wudu, and Bilal radiallahu anhu was also performing wudu with him. 
and the Prophet ﷺ looked at Bilal and said, Bilal, what is it that you do? Because last night I saw a dream and I heard your footsteps before me in Jannah. This is a very powerful statement. The Prophet ﷺ said, what is it that you do, Bilal, that Allah has admitted you into heaven before me? <coughs> And Bilal was very puzzled by this. I mean, this is an amazing elevation of a person who was until yesterday, in his own words, this is how he always described himself, until yesterday I was a slave. So, what, what does the Prophet ﷺ mean by saying, Bilal, what is it that you do that, that you went into heaven before me? I heard your footsteps before me. And Bilal said, maybe it is the fact that every time I do wudu, I pray nafil prayer as much as Allah ordained me. So sometimes two, sometimes four. It's called tahiyatul wudu. So every time he did wudu, Bilal used to offer those two salah. His, his own idea, his own, today we would call it bidah, but that is it. He did it and it pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that this is the tradition. But what is also important is that the Prophet sallallahu was trying to elevate an African slave to such high status to say that he's entered Jannah even before the Prophet That was the age where racism was, was not an issue. Salman al-Farsi was another foreigner from a different kind of race. Rumi, uh, Rumi was another companion. I also want to talk about Ayyub al-Ansari, a very important companion of the Prophet Now, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was a companion who was from Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, he wanted to, he, he was going to stay with somebody, but he did not want to pick because the choice would then become political and it would privilege somebody, it would insult or anything else. So he said, I'm not going to pick with whom I will stay, I will let my camel choose. So wherever the camel stops, that is where I'm going to stay. And the camel of the Prophet ﷺ stopped in front of the house of Abu Ayyub al Sari. And the Prophet stayed with him until he had a cigar. So he's a very special Sahaba. He's extremely privileged. And he was always, always part of nearly every campaign that the Muslims fought until 50, nearly 40, 50 years after the death of Prophet. They say the only battles that Abu Ayyub al Ansari missed was because he was in another battle elsewhere. But one of his speciality was that he was part of the first Muslim campaign against Constantinople. He was 96 years old, 96, 97, and yet he wanted to go there because he remembered the hadith where Prophet ﷺ said, those who conquered Constantinople will be forgiven their sins. So Ayyub al Ansari went with them. At the age of 96, he got wounded and then he told people, even if I die, I want you to carry my body all the way to Constantinople. And he died on the way. And so his fellow soldiers carried his body up to Constantinople and buried it outside the gates. Several years later, probably seven, eight hundred years later, when Mehmed conquered Constantinople, a few days after that, he started seeing Ayyub al Ansari in his dreams. And then he remembered these hadith and traditions and knew that. So they searched and they found his grave, and now they have a big, beautiful mosque there. And since 1450, 1459, when that shrine was built, Ottoman emperors have started every military campaign by first going to that masjid, which is attached to Ayyub al-Ansari's shrine, and praying there and then launching their military campaigns. Ayyub al-Ansari, because of his long age and his close companionship with, with the Prophet, وسلم, also narrated many hadiths. And one of his hadiths that he has narrated is, is very beautiful. He says, Whoever says ten times, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu, lahul mulku, walahul hamdu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, that there is no God except Allah, He is one, He has no partner, He is the sovereign, and His is all praise, and He is omnipotent. So whoever says, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu, lahul mulku, walahul hamdu, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, will have a reward equal to that of freeing four slaves. This, this hadith is muttafiq alayhi in the sense that it is in both Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. 
This is an important hadith narrated by Ibn Ansari. I will talk about most of Sahaba in the evening, and I'm going to leave you with one tradition from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala. One man came to the Prophet sallallahu and there are many hadiths which talk about this zikr. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu told his wife about this zikr, and the Prophet sallallahu has told many companions about this zikr, but uh, I like to talk about this particular tradi- origins of this study. The man came and complained to the Prophet sallallahu that the world is unfair. And he says, why is the world unfair? He said, I'm competing with Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr prays, I pray. Abu Bakr fasts, I fast. Abu Bakr goes on jihad, I go on jihad. But Abu Bakr is rich and poor. I can't compete with him in Sadaqah. Abu Bakr donates, gives charity. There are people living on pensions granted by Abu Bakr. Like they used to go a monthly and collect like a pension from his house. But what can I do? How do I fill the gap? Because in deeds I can compete with him, but in Sadaqah and charity I cannot. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, say SubhanAllah 33 times, say Alhamdulillah 33 times, say Allahu Akbar 33 times, and then the hundredth time say La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And when you say this, Allah will pardon all your sins, forgive and you will catch up. But the next day, the person came back and he was still very unhappy because Abu Bakr had also heard of this zikr and Abu Bakr had also started doing the zikr. Why would he miss the chance? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qad aflaha man tazakka wa zakra ismi rabbihi fasallah. Indeed, he is successful who remembers Allah with all his names and offers salah. This is another ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala links doing zikr with remembering his names and offering salah. Uh, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this month of Ramadan, when we are trying to deal with both our brains and our hearts, we satisfy, we abstain from food and everything, so there are only two things that we need to feed and feed as much as we can. Feed our hearts by doing zikr, feed our minds by learning about our being. Read as much as you can about the Quran and understand it, and also do dhikr. So reading the Quran through understanding is the best way of feeding both the mind and the brain. Rabbana atayna fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati wa hasnatan fi nata ban naar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'amuru bil adli wa al-ihsan wa al-jamil. Qurba wa yanhari fashna al-munkar wa bariya zakum la allakum tazakkaroon wa khim as-salam. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على السلام حي على السلام حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله
وكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا آمين هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الله
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 